Well, hello and welcome everyone. I'm your host, Zach Hules. Today, we're bringing you a webinar in collaboration with our partners at Performix. With today's new regulatory measures, you need to be able to use technology to your advantage in order to better serve and provide more complete and more proactive service to your clients. Our virtual roundtable today will discuss the processes and procedures they've established to resolve some of these issues. But before we actually get into our program today, I do have just a few housekeeping items. All attendees are on mute and in listen only mode. And if you have a question, I ask that you please use the Q&A of the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to address these questions as time permits at the end of the session. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you, Steve Lance. Steve Lance is a VP of sales with Performex. And he has more than 25 years of Silicon Valley startup experience in various leadership positions with companies such as Park Place, Ballastert, and Intralinx. Additionally, he's served in a sales leadership role working for Steve Jobs when Next was sold to Apple. At each company, he focused on creating highly profitable software IPOs while maintaining a customer-centric mentality. In his current position at Performex, Lance focuses on a further development of the customer-first, forecast-reliable, and growth-oriented sales organization. And Steve will be leading today's discussion, so I'll now turn things over to him today to introduce our panel. Steve, welcome. Thank you, Zach, and thank you everyone for joining today. We have an all-star cast of professionals with incredible experience and insights into the life settlement market, its evolution, and how you can personally benefit. Now, our focus today is going to be on helping you be aware of what you can do. We're going to try to, um, as I like to call it, demystify the process. We're going to dive into some best practices and help you decide on the best course of action for you and your clients. So with that, I'd like to introduce our 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 participants, I was going to call them victims, that's probably not fair, but um, our participants, um, again, tremendous about background, and I'm going to start with John B. Mendelson. Uh, John is the co-founder and CEO of Asher Group. Asher serves financial professionals and fiduciaries as an independent advanced planning resource for life settlements, longevity solutions, and policy valuations. Since launching Asher Group in 2003, John has been an influential member of the industry, serving as an advocate for best practices and transparencies. Uh, again, another favorite word for me too. Um, he's worked tirelessly, tirelessly to collaborate with members of the insurance and financial services, legal and trust communities. Uh, John has earned two bachelor's and a master's degree from the University of Florida. He's participated in the strategic coach program for six years to continue his development, both professionally and personally. Asher is a proud supporter of the company cause Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, as he has family members battling this challenge for decades. Um, he and his family reside in Orlando, Florida. John, let me be the first to welcome you to the panel. Second of all, we have Ryan Thompson, who is the co-founder of and CEO of Policy Market, a platform that connects buyers and sellers of life insurance assets in a way that is streamlined while delivering the highest value for owners. Thompson is a serial technology entrepreneur whose passion for building and unlocking complicated concepts has inspired him to create one of the most innovative asset platforms in the area of life insurance. Since developing policy market, Thompson has been able to revolutionize buying and selling of policies, making it easier, simpler, and faster, delivering true value to users. Now, prior to policy market, he, was, he founded Coco, um, a mobile payment platform that was ultimately sold to SPX Corporation. Uh, Ryan holds a bachelor's degree in neuroscience from the University of Virginia. And he was also Division I's men's, men's lacrosse national champion. Uh, congratulations on that. Thanks. And welcome, Ryan. Thanks, Steve. And last and certainly not least, Jim Purdy has served as the Director of Origination since April 2018 for Magna Life Settlements. Jim is an executive with over 15 years of sales experience, which includes all aspects of insurance specializing in income planning and wealth transfer. He's demonstrated a command of solution-based selling, which includes products and services, direct markets, and within various distribution channels. And for all of the, those who don't know Magna Life Settlements, a leading life settlement provider licensed wherever state insurance regulations require, but they're able to do business in every state. Magna Life Settlements has been active in the life settlement industry since 2004, it was acquired by 2010 by Vita Capital, a multi-billion dollar alternative asset management firm. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for having me. So with those credentials, I think we're gonna have a lot of fun. Um, I, I'm gonna kind of kick things off with a few questions and we're looking for a lot of interaction, a lot of transparency today. John, I'm gonna start with you though. Um, I'd like you to maybe share a little bit of a history lesson for everyone. Uh, life settlements has been around a long time. Um, 
I've always confused it with viaticals. And if you could uh, share a little bit about that, that would be helpful. But I, I would also appreciate it if you could take a few minutes and just kind of bring everybody up to speed, both on that history, but also where the market is today. Sure, I'm happy to do it. And there's definitely confusion based on the, the viatical market versus today's current highly regulated life settlement market. And the market itself are very different. So for those of you that are maybe going off previous information, past information from 20 plus years ago, I'm really happy that you're here to, today to kind of learn about what life settlement markets um, are like today and how you could potentially help your clients with it. So from a big picture standpoint, the viatical market dealt with individual investors, very short life expectancies. It was not regulated. Um, and it was just a very different market compared to fast forward the life settlement market today. And in 2020 and beyond, the market's 100% you know, uh, regulated. You can do a life settlement in any specific state. Life expectancies are on average 15 years to even as long as 18 years, depending on the type of product that it is. The type of investors in today's market, it's really focused on institutional, very sophisticated investors, reinsurers, private equity, all different types of endowments of capital, state pension plans. So it's a very different market from that perspective. All types of policies can qualify, including term insurance, which is something that, that's uh, typically listed as zero on the balance sheet. Uh, so hopefully that is something that can also stand out. And from a big picture perspective, as we look at where the market's going and what's happening next, um, with all the different uh, best interest regs and everything else headed that way, um, there's really an opportunity to help solve your clients' problems. We're seeing that a lot, especially over COVID uh, in 2020, being able to really help clients repurpose their existing life insurance to solve today's problem. So we're really talking about a pretty significant area that you can have a high impact with your clients because you're not asking them to necessarily write a check. You're working with them to see what their policy could be worth and to see if they can help solve other issues by repurposing their policy um, and creating liquidity from that. So hopefully that gives you a big picture idea um, of where the market's at. It does, thank you, John. Jim, Magnus has been one of the largest buyers in the market. Um, can you share a little bit in the time that you've been here on what kind of changes you've seen? Um, how do you source policies and where you see the market today as well? Sure. Uh, I think the biggest change that I've seen in the marketplace over the last 15 years is the advent of technology into this space. One from the sense of a agent or general agency digitizing their book of business. And then two, that we now have studied all of the cases that guys like Ryan and John have sent in over the last 10 years to Magna and have been able to come up with profiles so that we can then look at that digitized book of business and point to where, you know, the opportunities may exist. Excellent. Uh, that's very helpful. And Ryan, I'm going to keep on the technology vent for just a second too. So um, being one of the newer companies on the panel, but your company was founded to streamline process and eliminate complexity. Given your background in software, can you describe some of those historical complexities that, that people have had to deal with and how technology is being applied to this market today? That's a, that's a good question, Steve. So I think one of the largest complexities in the marketplace is that agents, advisors, BGAs, they don't know what they have in their book of business and their clients, the policy owners themselves, they don't know what the value of these policies are. So with policy market, we're, we built a platform that is super easy to use and identify opportunities and bring that opportunity all the way through to the close and the sale of a policy. So for agents and advisors, the platform was built to uh, identify value in one policy or an entire book of business. And so this technology lets you, you know, quickly identify the value of your book of business and offer, you know, offer that opportunity and that conversation to have with, with your clients. You know, we're all here today because we have books of business and we want to do the best thing for our clients and everyone wants to make some money along the way. So to be able to provide them with opportunities and options for their life insurance, it's a great thing. And traditionally, this has been a complex process, but with the use of technology through uh, 
you know, through different means, Performex is, does a great job at uh, letting you see into your book of business, giving you insight to not only your as sold data, but your in force data as well. And that's where you're going to really be able to unlock that value for your client is to know what's going on in your book of business right now. You may have inherited a book, you have an existing book and you're not doing much with it. This is an opportunity to get an insight and um, provide, provide that value. It's about being proactive with your clients, not reactive. You know, I, and I think, thank you, gentlemen, for that. That's a good solid foundation here of, of how we kind of got to where we are. Um, I, I want to dig into the whys, though. I mean, you know, why should these folks care? Um, I think we have a lot of advisors, uh, agents on the phone that, that are looking at this saying, you know, maybe I have some clients that fit this, maybe I don't. Um, I, I want you to kind of dig into a little bit about, you know, what kind of guidance do you provide them on you know, how do you identify these things and, and what do you do with them? And I'm going to mix up the order here a little bit. So Ryan, I'll come back to you first. You talk to advisors all the time. Um, what advice do you give them on, you know, how to find these things and what they should consider in that conversation? I would say, uh, first and foremost, do not let your client lapse or surrender their policy. That, that could be the worst thing that, uh, that could happen for them. They've, they've put a lot of money in and uh, worked hard to uh, keep that asset alive and things change in uh, people's lives, circumstances. So for one, don't let them lapse or value, or, or excuse me, don't let them lapse or surrender their policy. But the important thing here is to understand and be able to identify at-risk policies and, and be upfront there and have that, uh, that information about the value of the policy and have that educated conversation with them. You see many, many uh, advisors and or policy owners, they don't realize that life insurance is oftentimes the, the most valuable asset that their client has, more valuable than their home. And very much like a home, they, they own this asset and they can sell it. It's a, it's a viable, it's a, safe, uh, it's a safe transaction, it's highly regulated. And, you can make a real difference in your client's life by presenting them with their option. They, they have this asset that has value and they'd like to know, wouldn't you like to know what that value is uh, today versus when they bought it or when they die? John, I'm going to ask you to build on that. I, I think that's an interesting topic that we're starting to dig in here. Um, and, 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 and your intro talks about best practices and transparency. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, you know, one of the questions that, that I think gets asked, and I think this is a fair one, is, you know, if the policy is worth buying, you know, why shouldn't the policyholder keep it? You know, and, and what, what is, you know, when these conversations come up with advisors, how do you counsel them? Um, you know, the answer is they should consider keeping the policy. Uh, just because the policy has value doesn't mean they should sell it. It really comes down to why was the policy originally put in place and have they transitioned out of that original need? If they have and they can free up liquidity for other planning areas, now they're in a they might be in a better spot um, than they than they would have if they wouldn't even have had the policy. When you purchase life insurance, it's really for um, planning purposes. Maybe it's for to to solve financial issues when a family's at their absolute you know most vulnerable time with the loss of a loved one or a significant planning situation um, at that level. Well, with the life settlement, they might have the ability to maximize that value while they're living be able to create a pool of liquidity to solve other needs that they have. So, you know, the market itself with, when you have these large institutions purchasing policies that I, I kind of talked about earlier, they, they really have virtually two things that an individual client does not have. They have unlimited capital and law large numbers compared to a client that might have a finite amount of capital and they only own one or two policies, maybe a handful of policies. So, when you think about that, you know, it's the ability for these large institutions, these large purchasers such as Magna and others that have the ability to, uh, to pull these policies together. They don't know if they're right or wrong if they have a thousand policies in a portfolio on any one individual one, but they know as a whole, no different than mutual funds, indexes and other large um, sophisticated um, structures. They know that down the road, their law of large numbers will win. So, you know, kind of going back to what uh, Ryan and Jim talked about a little bit from a technology perspective, we're all able to really
quickly calculate what the value of a policy might look like today. Um, we use a Salesforce platform with a buyer portal so we can force competition between buyers um, as, we, as we go there, as we share information, because it's all about protecting client um, data, how you handle information. You don't want to put health or financial data in the wrong hands or not have it securely out there. So as an agent, as an advisor, I really encourage you to ask questions. How do you share data? How do you communicate this information as you go through this process? Because you would never ignore a real estate portfolio, an art collection, anything like that when you're working with your clients or if you're having a discussion with the attorney, CPA, or some other center of influence, um, you would actually, you would know what all of their assets are worth, including their life insurance portfolio. So that's hopefully another good um, takeaway for you as agents is this is a conversation that you can have with your centers of influence to help differentiate your insurance practice versus others that might call on them. Tell them that you also work with the ability of understanding the fair market value of life insurance and you've included that in your policy review process. So just trying to give you more things to talk about along the way. Yeah, I love the fact that you describe it as a, an asset like uh, so many of these other things because I think that gets lost in the shuffle. Um, Jim, you've worked with hundreds of, of general agencies, um, advisors, agents um, over the years. You know, from a buyer's perspective, what kind of guidance can you give um, the people on the phone today in terms of you know, what they should be looking at I think that I think a fundamental understanding that there are really two types of life settlement deals that exist out there. There are deals that we call favorable cost structure. Um, and there are deals that are kind of health arbitrage deals where somebody's health changed since the issuance of the contract. For the most part, the majority of the policies that we're purchasing as investors our universal life coverage. Now it's okay if it started out as a term and then converted there, but most of them are ULs. They're also issued typically standard or better non-smoker class. Now it doesn't mean that something else doesn't work, but if you're looking at a perfectly healthy client sitting in front of you, they probably need to be over the age of 75 uh, with a UL policy if they're perfectly healthy. And anybody that's uh, maybe younger uh, it probably has to have a little health change, depending on if it was standard or super preferred would certainly be a distinguisher. And then as you tear down, so let's say you have a, a term policy that converts to an expensive UL, or you maybe have a term policy that's non-convertible, then you're just going to have to have a bigger change in health from whatever it was issued at. So I think the, the basics of knowing what, what you have in front of you, what kind of policy is it, and then what your health status is probably starts the ball rolling. Uh, super exciting in settlements to be able to, you know, change people's lives and in, in, in these transactions. Sometimes I've seen people where they're literally in a single transaction uh, having the amounts that they may have taken 30 years to build up into their nest egg. So sometimes these things are quite impactful, especially when you see it happen on a term policy where they thought there was no value. And you know, ultimately giving money away is relatively easy comparative to what your normal financial professional does for a living. So uh, you know, I try to emphasize field underwriting and the basics of what we just covered because I'd hate to see somebody blow their phones up in their office, you know, for people looking for money when, they're, when their policies really, you know, may not have a present valuation of, for cash. So uh, groups like Ryan and John are really good at what they do and filtering that out and, um, you know, reach out if, you, if you're not sure, but, but certainly uh, if somebody has a non-convertible term or super expensive, heavily rated policy, they're going to have to have some pretty significant health uh, benefit or, you know, impairment so that there's policy value. Yeah, I, I love those use cases. And are there any other use cases, Jim, that you can share anything, you know, if, if they're looking through their, you know, through their book? I mean, what, what do advisors look for? What guidance do you give them on what other kinds of things to look for? <laughs> you know, to be able to find things to help their policyholders? Yeah, um, 
Well, one of them is the look for, I'll go over, and then the other one's kind of an add-on. So the first one, you're going for the oldest people in your book, and you're looking for whoever had the best rating from the insurance carrier with the most competitive product. Uh, those are probably going to have the highest probability of settlement value because when you back, when you look at, well, what is a current value for a policy? Well, we know what the value is if they die to the beneficiaries, but relative to their health, the, the farther you go from future value to present, the smaller that present value is. And, and obviously when you're dealing with people that are, you know, advanced age, well, there's not there might not be a big gap there. So present values could be pretty big. Um, so start with your oldest best offers with, you know, whatever the most competitive carriers are. On the flip side of that, we know that insurance agents that are generally working a book of business, it's a really good time to do an insurance sale when a term's coming up to, uh, to the end because they're used to having coverage and now they may still need it. And when you're taking out policies 20 and 30 years in advance, who knows what the situation was going to be, and they still may need that coverage. Maybe they didn't save enough and they need some gap coverage. Maybe they like playing Wall Street and gambling, and they need to have some, some you know, just in case money there to hedge their position, or who knows what it is, right? So um, I think when general agents go out there to automatically sell insurance, and maybe they don't get that sale, they should absolutely be looking at, is there a health change on this person? What product does this convert to if it's still convertible? And, and double check and make sure there's not value. Those are some of the, the best deals. Uh, one jumps out at me. Uh, it was a $4 million, 68 year old, had some stomach cancer, per, you know, impaired for 68 but it wasn't anything that was killing them immediately. I mean, our life expectancies range from seven to nine years on this particular insured, which is significant, but, but still there's only two years left on the term policy and it only had five months left on the conversion option. So this, luckily this was an agent uh, that came to us from an outreach, never did a settlement before, um, looked at the valuation, you know, showed us all the medical records, did our stuff, and ultimately, in the end, the client chose to convert three million of the four and sell it, which a purchase price was a million dollars. This particular agent, uh, you know, took one hundred and fifty thousand in commission for that. They also now had the money to pay for a policy, so they converted the other one million for the family to keep. So in the end, this particular agent you know, they, they made about 150,000 as well on the conversion comp for the 4 million. And I remember the agent so excited that this actually worked because it was his first deal. Uh, he was telling me how his client, uh, who believed in him, but just when he went to the, the grocery store to get his coffee in the paper and make his route and he went to the bank and, and he's sitting there looking at $850,000 sitting in his checking account he was just like dumbfounded that, that, that that was the situation he's in at 68. I mean, talk about a, a massive change to, to his life. Um, you know, obviously he's in a bad situation health-wise, but uh, you know, pretty awesome story. And that was a brand new agent with the first deal. So I think the second part, if you're doing term sales and trying to convert life insurance, this is a great tool to have in your, in your box and to double check. Same thing with 1035s. If you're rolling out 1035s on annuities, it's like you really could be leaving a lot of money on the table for yourself as a producer, as well as your client, because you didn't ask what their health was. Yeah. So uh, those are the probably the two biggest takeaways I think people should, should look into. Thank you, Jim. I, I love the story. So I'm gonna put the other guys on the spot here too and make them, make them tell their, um, Ryan, um, you know, again, how, how do you, um, you know, what, what do you tell policyholders and advisors what to expect when they're getting ready to go into this process? And then ultimately, what stories can you share? I think, I think one of the, 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 the things to think about uh, for advisors is one, 
understand what you have, whether it's your entire book of business, which we can help identify and, and bubble those uh, most probable uh, opportunities up to the top, like Jim mentioned. Um, and we have very sophisticated algorithms to be able to do that and uh, enforce data really helps. Uh, so, you know, being on the Performex platform uh, and, and having that information up front, because, you know, from our experience, when, when you're an advisor or an agent, you want to have the conversation with your client about life settlements, knowing up front around what the value is. You, you may not know completely what their health uh, status is. So that's part of that conversation that you'll have. But if you understand what the potential value of that policy is going into the conversation, then it makes it an, an easier conversation to have because you can, you can present some options for your client, which is always a really good thing. Options are good. And one of these options, you know, one of the options could be to sell the policy. And if so, if you're able to go into that conversation and say, you know, I think that we may be able to sell your policy. So the first, the first step is understanding whether uh, it's, it's a good candidate, whether your client is a good candidate for a life settlement or not. Okay, if we check that box, then now it's that you can give them a range of what you think it could be worth, or you might be able to hold that back. But the first step is, is getting them to say, okay, let's pursue this option. So from there, it's much like uh, when the, the client took out their, uh, their policy, there's an application process. And many times we have to go out and, and get medicals so that we can understand their health of that, that client, that, that insured. Um, many times it's this, it's this insured is the same, but we need to understand the, uh, the health of the insured. And then we can get a more uh, honed in, honed in uh, uh, value of that policy. And we go out, we go to the entire market to companies like gyms and uh, big institutional investors and create a, a, a bidding process and get the most value for your client. So it's, it's important to have that that information upfront when you go into the conversation with your client so that you can get them to say, yes, let's pursue this uh, as an option and then move forward. And our platform handles the identification all the way through to close, making it super easy to manage uh, this, what could be a bit complicated and especially for first time uh, advisors, they've never done a settlement before, like Jim said, um, you know, we make it super easy, fast, faster than, uh, than it has been traditionally by having that information up front. You know, there are things that you need to, to get, like enforce illustrations, depending on what type of policies that your, your client has. We need to get a, an enforce illustration. Again, Performix can help uh, do that. You can get that on behalf of your client as well. And we can go out and find the, the best value. Now, you wanted a, Steve, you were talking about examples. Uh, you want to hear some stories, some success stories. So uh, a, a case that we just did was, was for a uh, first time uh, life settlement transaction, the advisor. Now this is something that we don't want to have happen, uh, but it's, it, it, it turned out to be a, a good story in the end, but the policy owner, uh, it was a universal life contract and they owned the policy, but they had only um, they had only planned on having that policy for 20 years. So it's in the 19th year, or actually it's in the 20th year. And they go, they go to the advisor and they ask him, what should I do with my policy? Now, this policy, the, the premiums were going to jump in the 21st year from, I believe it was a, a $250,000 policy. It wasn't anything huge, but the premiums were going to jump from $1,200 uh, a year if they wanted to keep the policy enforced for another five years, it was going to go to 8,200. And then uh, the client was 78 years old, had uh, a little bit of uh, cancer. And if they wanted to keep the policy enforced for another 10 years, the premium was going to jump to $11,000 a year. So the policy owner was going to let the policy lapse. The worst thing that could possibly happen without investigating potential options. They came to the advisor. Again, that's not what we want. We want to identify these opportunities and don't leave value on the table. Luckily, the advisor was savvy and came to us and said, you know, can we sell this policy? 
we were able to uh, go out to the market and get uh, about, a, I believe, uh, something like $80,000 check to uh, a client that thought they were going to get zero for this asset. Now, the agent looks like a hero. Then they made a nice commission, uh, the, probably more commission than they did selling the policy. And the 78-year-old who thought that there was no value in this asset well, just got an $80,000 check at 78 years old. And so it's a huge success story. And that's just one. But we don't want uh, you know, unfortunately it worked out, but we don't want to leave value in your book of business on the table. And so being proactive, not reactive is the way to go. And so I think that that was just one of the success stories. Great, Brian, thank you. And, and John, if you could tie some of that together, I, I want to hear your story too. Um, but I also want to kind of pin you down. You, you mentioned regulatory issues earlier. You know, this is a highly regulated industry. Um, you know, what, is, what are these guys getting into when, when they, you know, when they come to you? And, and how do you how do you coach them through that? Sure. Um, well, you know, this transaction is really no different than any other asset sale. You have those that are licensed to represent one side of the transaction, the seller, and those licensed to represent the buyer. Companies like mine and and uh, Ryan's we're, we're licensed to represent the seller, so it's our responsibility to force competition between buyers such as Jim's company, Magda. You know, one of the biggest buyers in the marketplace. So. Um, from a licensing regulatory standpoint, there is an organizational structure that exists. I used to hear when I got involved in this market, it was transitioning to the life settlement space and they'd say, gosh, this is an unregulated market. Well, that, does, that just does not apply today. Life settlements, as I said, are regulated in 100% of the states. The Department of Insurance has very clear licensing. So as just a recommendation to anybody listening and it, um, if you if you hear nothing out of today's <clears throat> presentation, the key is besides never let a policy lapse without first having it valued or considered. The second thing is whoever you're speaking with, you should always ask, are you licensed to represent the seller or are you licensed to represent a buyer? Because like any transaction, however you share and communicate information is key to the negotiation process. And it doesn't mean our buyers are malicious. There are a lot of really good people, um, very smart, uh, very credentialed, um, but their job is to generate the highest rate of return for their investors. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what they're licensed and, and experienced to do. So uh, a licensed broker, is rep, uh, their job is to shop the market, to force competition through an auction process to increase bidding, because the more you can increase bidding, the higher the value is to the client. So from a licensing regulatory standpoint, make sure that you're putting yourself in the right position by ensuring that you're offering, or excuse me, you're taking advice from parties that are on your side of the table. And once again, it's, there's nothing wrong with working with certain buyers direct and things like that. You just have to understand from a licensing e &O standpoint, what you're getting yourself involved with? Do you, can you provide a defensible body of work? Do you have the state uh, required reps, warranties, disclosures? That's part of all your different forms and applications. Do you add this to a business line? Um, can you demonstrate a defensibility of your body of work and price discovery, um, all the different forms approvals? You just got to really understand. So if somebody ever says, I don't know about that life settlement market, it's, that's just unregulated. It's the wild west. That's bad information. That's information from a really long time ago. Today, it's unbelievably sophisticated. There's pricing tools. There's underwriting tools that any legitimate player works with that can give you a range of value. You know, you wouldn't let someone walk through your house and say, gosh, come on in, come on in. If you're only going to sell your house for X amount of dollars and someone was telling you, well, your house is only worth about half of that. Well, you certainly wouldn't let anyone walk through your house to go determine if they were going to purchase it. Well, your medical information, your privacy, your financial information, you shouldn't let everybody walk through that either. You should have an understanding right up front. Does this uh, range of value even make sense for me? So um, just to, to close out the regulatory side, in doing this over you know, 17 years, we've literally had zero issues because reps, warranties, disclosures are talked, are signed off on by every client. No one will ever say, you tricked my poor Aunt Sally because they'd say, well, as trustee or as owner, you did sign off on this 32 times. 
and you know things like that. And I used to fight the inch thick contracts that we have in our market. But if you think about any asset sale, you have inch thick con contracts. If they were two pages long, you'd be really you know have, you'd be you know suspect of that. Right. And there's everything in there that protects all of us from best practices, looking out for the best interests of the client, um, and so on and so on. That's why so many fiduciary channels, BGAs, broker dealers, and others are becoming highly involved in the life settlement market with all the increased focus on Reg BI, fiduciary rule, New York 187, and all of these other types of things that it's really all about disclosure. You know, uh, I come from a family, parents are the first ones to go to college in our family. Our dad's a dermatologist. And, you know, dad says if there's four treatments for one of his patients and a fifth one comes along, he has to consider it. Is that the right option for my client? I won't just ignore it because I just don't think I want to share it. Well, as a financial advisor, agent, and so on, this is just another non-forfeiture option. They can surrender, they can cancel the policy, they can reduce the face. Maybe a life settlement makes sense. Have it, have it valued. Make sure it's being valued by somebody on your side of the table, just so you can answer that question if someone ever asks. So hopefully that gives a nice picture about that. I do have some case studies if I have enough time for that, Steve. You do, you do. I, I'm getting a few questions and, and before I, I give it back to you though, if anyone else has questions, please make sure they come to me on the chat. Um, we're going to have a few minutes for questions, but John, story away. Sure. So, you know, we, we recently did a study of the last thousand or so policies that we closed. And, you know, we, we created, you know, hundred and hundred, you know, or excuse me, billions to consumers out of all these contracts, okay, that we sold over, over the years. And, you know, we said, well, what are you using these funds for? It was to fund caregiving needs. It was to put into other products and services. Maybe it was to purchase annuities for the beneficiaries. They received 800,000, how about 400, 400 for them? And on and on and on. Maybe it was for AUM, uh, for asset center management, things like that. Multi-generational insurance planning. You sell a policy on mom or dad and use the proceeds to fund coverage on the insurable 40 to 60 year old. So there's all types of things you can look at. Out of that same block of a thousand policies, 22%, and this kind of blew my mind, 22% were on people over the age of 90. They literally outlived all the planning. If we, if any time we present around the country, I say, raise your hand if you, have, if you know somebody that's in their late 80s to even 90s, pretty much every hand goes up in there. Yeah. During COVID, what, one thing that we've been able to really do well, and I, I'm very proud of this, um, and I'm sure um, Jim and Ryan could feel the same way, we're, we've been able to help people take policies and sell their policy to fund caregiving needs, keeping maybe mom or dad at home versus putting in an assisted living facility. We've helped business owners that were avoiding bankruptcy or having and looking for ways to pay for and retain their top staff. And they were able to take one of their existing business planning policies, whether it's term or some other type of contract and sell that. Um, we've, had, we've seen policies sitting in islets that that no one expected mom or dad to be living well into their advanced ages. And they're about to cancel policies and we're able to help them um, repurpose those policies for today's needs as well, just to put a lump sum. We've even helped a lot of charities that the donor had the audacity to keep living well into their <laughs> mid eighties and even nineties. And they were canceling the policy for 10 to 20,000 and we generate a million for it. You know, if it was multi, you know, one of them was a 3 million that we did that for. And they're able to see the benefit while they're living, how the funds are being used. So there's all types of really awesome things that our market does. I would, I would close out my, my portion of this with, um, you've heard uh, Ryan and Jim talk about this. I just want to kind of echo it. Sort your database by age. Look at everybody, 90 and older first, 85 to 89, 80 to 84, then 79 and younger. Look for people paying their premiums out of existing cash value. And they just don't know that there's another option that can exist. Make this part of your policy review process. Um, reach out to experts that have done this business and they, they have bid data, they have product data that can tell you where to find those, those immediate opportunities. And you're gonna feel really good about your insurance planning practice. You know, it's, it's, you're gonna have this big kind of 
pool that you can, or excuse me, a lake that you get to fish in of your, your clients that you've been able to help and work with for decades. And now you can help them at this stage in their life. So I, we're a pretty mushy company as a family owned business. And I can tell you that you're going to really find this to be a rewarding um, business to add to, to what you're currently doing. So I, I hope you uh, take that seriously. And I know we have more questions to come, Steve. Yeah, so. that's very helpful, though. I, that's great. I mean, we've got oh, one question came across to everybody, and then I've got a bunch of individual ones. But let's start with the big one. Um, how do the carriers feel about this? And, you know, this is a really, I think, an interesting conversation that we could probably make a separate topic on. But, you know, um, Jim, you're kind of in the middle mm -hmm. of this. I'm going to let you kind of kick that off. But, you know, how do you, how do you interact with the carriers? And, you know, are the carriers going to make it difficult for people to, uh, to do this? Yeah, I'm going to be really uh, blunt about this. They're not in love with it. Um, but the right to know uh, is, is trending. And there are nine carriers now that or nine states that make the carrier disclose the settlement option. Now, their disclosures might not look, you know, they try to paint a picture like your policy is owned by the mob or some individual when this is super sophisticated multi-billion dollar funds, um, you know, that are, that are owning these, these are institutions and sometimes even insurance carriers. So it's, um, for the most part, um, I, I don't, I don't think the carriers like it, but, uh, but that doesn't mean that this isn't a right for the, for the policy owner to have. And certainly, you know, as well as I know that if we had a house for sale, let's say, and the only person you could sell it to is the person you bought it from, your value wouldn't be very high because they know what you paid for it. <laughs> and as soon as you can go out to a marketplace, you know, you're gonna be able to get much more value. So why, why take the carrier's word for it that the cash value is zero or that it's 10% of the face when, when you know, it might be worth significantly more? Right. Right. Uh, John or Ryan, either one of you want to jump in on the carrier conversation? I can't have you, Ryan, if you want to say something first. Um, I mean, yeah, I think just to echo what, what Jim said, I mean, it's, 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 your, it's your fiduciary responsibility to your client to, uh, to look into life settlement as an option. And the carriers may not like it, but it's, it's an asset that is owned by your client and they have the right to, uh, to get the fair market value for that. And there are, you know, look, I, you know, I was told once never really worry about the insurance company because they always, they always make out in the end. And so really your responsibility is to your client. And so um, I think that uh, I think that that's, that's an important thing to, to consider. Yeah. I guess from my perspective, and we've been pretty heavily involved on committees for the insurance and financial services industry for over 15 years, um, that it, is a, it, it was a significant concern due, due to early abuses in the life settlement market and other surrounding finance industries and things like that, for sure, um, in the early to mid 2000s and a little bit beyond um, as they saw the life settlement market start to clean itself up, become more regulated, you know, kind of accept some of the self-inflicted wounds, um, things like that, things kind of progressed. Uh, we, uh, because of agreements, I can't disclose names, but we, we have relationships with multiple insurance carrier distribution channels. We do CE and training for multiple carriers to make sure they understand best practices. I can tell you that they're, they're, um, open to doing what's best for the client. They just don't want to see abuses taking place. Um, they want to make sure if it is done, it's done the right way, like everything else that they would expect. Um, I think they were pleasantly surprised years ago when they realized that this was really just the, the fly on the tail of an elephant, <laughs> size of a market compared to the 20 plus trillion dollar insurance industry. When the life settlement market did a whopping, I think the most recent Conning study said somewhere around 7 billion of policies were completed when there's a thousand billions in a trillion and it's a 20 plus trillion dollar industry. I think you could kind of see that they felt a little bit better when those abuses 
went away um, probably 15 years ago that dealt with something called stranger originated life insurance. That, that doesn't even exist today. We never see it. It's on the fringe if, if you were to ever even hear about it. So I would tell you that insurance carriers, um, as Jim kind of noted, we've met some of their investment funds at different conferences. They see this. I mean, how do you hedge a billion dollar block of mortality risk? How about a billion dollar block of longevity risk from the life settlement space? So um, I think they're respecting our market. The more we include best practices and disclosure, I know that a lot of the folks that we've been on committees with, um, they appreciate the, uh, being educated by our industry uh, and not villainized, but they rightfully so had some reasons to be frustrated when abuses were taking place. But the more professionals that come into our market, um, the more this will be kind of brought into the mainstream insurance planning um, space. And I, I still attest there'll be a day when they say, I can't imagine, you're telling me there was a time when you couldn't sell your life insurance. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's well said. I, I like that. Um, one, one other question, then we'll go for final comments. Um, uh, Jim, I'm going to start with you too. Uh, you know, a couple questions just came in about how do you do valuations? How do you price these things? Yeah, it's, you know, it's pretty simple. We're just looking at what the cost of insurance. Um, we like to see it out to maturity. Some, some buyers want to go to age 100. Uh, our modeling has the ability to extrapolate down. So it's usually better just to go to maturity of the policy, minimum level. Um, everybody in the industry, for the most part, is comfortable using the current assumption. So no need to make it look expensive as possible by using guarantees. Just use the, the current cost. And then um, we're gonna get medical records and go out and get life expectancies. Some life expectancy curves are shaped differently than others. So each buyer might have a little different opinion. And for the most part, we're just overlaying what the cost is to what the uh, life expectancy curve shows. Um, sometimes you're bidding it at 50% probability. And sometimes, you know, depending on the risk you wanna look at that 80 or 90, 100% probability of death. So it's a little bit different. Every buyer structured um, a little different. I think the industry uh, you know, has a lot of different opinions as we get into the institutional side. They're not really set to use third party opinions. They wanna look at it for themselves. And so you have some variations of what one group thinks they're gonna live versus another. So, you know, services that John and Ryan provide are, are helpful so that they can kind of gauge, you know, what kind of risk is this that we're putting to the market and, and you know, who, who likes that. So, uh, you know, that's, I think the, the biggest thing is when transitions happen in someone's life, you have to look at this and to get into the weeds of how we're valued is probably you know, just get into more that nobody likes learning something new after 30 years of a practice. You can be like the 800 pound gorilla and everybody looks to you for the best insurance advice. And you're just really protecting people your whole life that if something bad happens, you know, you've taken care of them. And to be able to flip that switch to where you're now saying, wait a second, the family's not going to get this. I, this is what I did for them. I think, I think the best thing I could tell the advisors instead of teaching them what to, how we calculate as investors is that embrace change, embrace that their life cycle of why people buy insurance is changing or the needs may change like John talked about with long-term care and, and just be willing to go out and learn something new and try something. And I think after you do that, I think most advisors that I've come in contact with are really incorporating this now into their annual reviews because it's just another box to check. And I've seen some, I saw a recent one where it was a 85 year old mom was in good health. Dad's already passed away, unfortunately. And they had a second to die policy. We all know those are a little bit cheaper than the individual. And, and ultimately, in this scenario, uh, the policy matured at joint age 100. And now that mom's over 85 and doesn't have any major issues, she's looking at 
a 10 to 15% chance that everything they ever paid in premium is, is gone. There's no policy at the end if she, if she goes past joint age 100. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, they didn't do a life settlement necessarily because they needed the cash or they didn't do it because they were raising money for mom. It was a wealthy family. They did it because the family uh, just flat out couldn't take a 15% chance that nothing was going to come at the end of it. So, you know, business owners buy sell agreements, like sometimes these settlements, you know, they're not, they're not quite what you think, but you know, I implore all of these advisors to embrace the change. You're not in the wild west anymore. Every state for the most part is regulated and you have to be willing to learn something new uh, so that you can put your clients, uh, you know, information that's important to them. So, you know, get out there, get educated. You're not going to be an expert in one panel here, but you know, if somebody's going through a long-term care issue, you want to, you want to look at this for some money, nothing like realigning the family to its natural order where you're, where you're getting mom or dad, the best care that money can buy instead of having to pick between you know, funding your kid's college or taking care of your parents. So I think, you know, as that situation, or maybe there's different provisions in their contract that are coming due, or this, that, or the other, or you're looking at an acceleration of death benefit, you know, a lot of those products are really built on generalities for underwriting. Insurance carriers, for the most part, are not very good at impaired risk underwriting. They're really good at looking at risk on healthy people. So when you, when you take a generality to accelerate a death benefit, when the life settlement industry is really out there and willing to individually underwrite somebody's actual health curve and give you a present valuation, it might be a lot more money. So, you know, whatever your change situation is, uh, I think that should send up a flag to make a phone call to, you know, to, to someone that, that knows about this business. And that ultimately, um, I think will suit you quite well. And, you know, you just go from there. Excellent. And, and so Ryan, I'm going to ask you the question a little bit differently. You work with a lot of different buyers. Um, do you see how they price differently? And then as a final note, maybe some commentary from you too, about, you know, what kinds of things would you like to leave? What ideas, concepts, hints, would you like to leave the audience with? Yeah, we work with you know pretty much all the buyers in the in the industry. There's there's certainly you know tier one, tier two, and tier three buyers. We like to work with the top tier buyers, Magna being one of them. And um, you know there's a there's a range of of buyers and a range of portfolios that the buyers buy on behalf of, and everyone has a little bit different uh, take on it. So one of our jobs is to identify, you know, which buyers that these policies are best suited for. You know, some buyers um, won't buy guaranteed UL policies, and some will. And some will, some buyers will buy um, with with not having to go out for APSs. I know Magna in some cases will will do that uh, on some of the smaller policies. So it's important to have. Uh, to have somebody that is advocating for your client and finding the best value out there. So our job is to search that market and, and place your policy with, with the best buyer. Um, so, you know, there's some, there's some policies that uh, people thought couldn't be sold. And so to, to identify a buyer that would, that would buy that policy is important. But one of the things that I'd like to, to leave off with is, is don't leave money on the table in your book of business. You know, whether it's one policy or your entire book of business that we can price, you know, it, with these, with this software technology in, you know, in minutes really, and give you insight into your book of business that then you can make actionable and you can have a conversation with your client about their options, which is really important. And that makes you look educated. Look, you put your client into this asset and you look like a hero if their needs change and you can provide them with an option that helps them today. And you can repurpose those funds, use it to sell uh, other opportunities. And the key thing 
one of the key things here is to be able to have access to that enforced data. So if you have a book of business and you know what you, you know, you know, it, it's as sold, but how, if you have an entire book of business, how can you possibly service all of your clients effectively? And you, you need to have tools to be able to do that. And so our platform does helps you with that. Performex helps you with that. And so to be able to, you know, quickly bubble up opportunities and be able to pick up the phone and call your client, especially in times of COVID, it's, it's difficult to get uh, in front of your client. Maybe they don't want you going into their home. Well, this is a reason that you can call them and do your annual review or identify if that policy is at risk and have a conversation, understand what their current needs are, understand what their health conditions are, and be able to do it with a few clicks of a button. There's no way you could possibly service your clients without, and that's, that's probably what's happening today. You know, I ask a lot of advisors, how do you service your clients? And they say, well, we really don't. And so this gives you a, a tool to be able to do that. And so I think, uh, you know, reach out to us, call us. We're running some really great programs right now. And I'd love to talk more and, and find out about your business. So thank you, Ryan. And John, I put you on the spot first. I'm going to let you take the last segment here, two minutes or less. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on value and what would you like to leave everyone with final thought? Sure. Yeah, it, it's really all about fair market value. Uh, willing buyer, willing seller, arms distance, I mean, no, you know, relation to, to, to really determine what an asset could be worth. This industry is no different. Um, we rely heavily upon our bid data. You know, we have literally 10,000 plus policies that we've negotiated bids, massive amounts of data. We can sort it by product type, by age, by impairment, really having a good idea based on that. And it's that type of certainty that gives us the ability. Um, and, uh, you know, and it sounds like everybody else has their, their own capability within that as well, of course. But just talking from our standpoint, it's all about the auction process. I feel better knowing if I was selling my house that I had, you know, a, a few dozen, in, you know, funds competing, or excuse me, investors competing to bid on my home. Same thing with this policy. You want a track record of people that know how to do it. For the same reason, they rely upon a BGA or other group to do a lot of a lot of the work. Um, you can leverage the the um, pipeline, the negotiation power of some of the groups like that. Just remember to ask that one question: Are you working with a licensed buyer who's a fiduci fiduciary to the investor, or licensed um, representative to the seller? They're both. There's good players on both sides. You just have to determine how you want to approach the market. Very good. John, thank you. Well, and, and with that, I'd like to kind of, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, NAFA for providing the venue for today's event. Uh, we certainly appreciate the opportunity. Uh, second of all, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. Um, I know it was a lot of work, guys, um, but I really appreciate all the energy that everybody put into building up to and to today. And then finally, to thank the audience. Um, the, the phrase that I wanted to use early on was demystify. And, and I think we did that. I took eight pages of notes. Um, I think I learned a lot too. So with that, um, I'd like to just, again, thank everybody for the time. Pass it back to Zach to close up. Thank you so much, Steve, for leading this uh, informative discussion today. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Jim and Ryan and John, for being on as panelists as well. Uh, it was great hearing from you all. And uh, thanks to everyone who joined us today. Uh, I do appreciate that as well. If you would like to uh, watch this recording, a recording of this was made available and will be available on demand uh, will be on the NAFA website and uh, same location as you registered as well so you can go on there and uh, watch that on demand which should be available later this week and um, yeah thank you so much for uh, everyone joining us today and if you would like to uh, you can reach out to us and um, we can maybe put you in touch with one of these fine gentlemen with their contact info of course and uh, if you have any questions for them after the after the presentation. So again, thank you all for joining us and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Take care. Exactly. Thanks, Thanks guys.